Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life and the gift of faith. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, we are on uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 3. We've got uh, quite a guy today, St. John the Baptist. Um, at the beginning of uh, chapter 3, uh, John is preaching. Uh, Luke gives us a whole bunch of um, uh, dating techniques. He says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, well, we pretty well know exactly when that was. And he gave us a whole bunch of other things also, too. It says, um, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went throughout the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Hey, Paul, you're good at this. Why don't you find a map of uh, ancient Israel and show us the Jordan River? Sure. And... Uh, put the map up on the screen for us um the jordan river is not a great big river at all and many places you can you know walk across it without it going over your head and so john is baptizing in the jordan river and when he baptized he would uh the person would go under the water I don't know if you know what the word baptism comes from. It comes from Greek, baptizo, which means a sunken ship. <laughs> when a ship sinks, the water is all around it, through it, soaking into the boards, you know. And to be baptized is to be completely enveloped by the water and the symbolism is that uh, thank you and the symbolism is that you are going under the water and you're dying because under the water we can't breathe we drown and then you come out of the water and you are alive so when john was baptizing it was not Christian baptism. Yeah, you see there the Jordan River. Uh, and some of the names of the towns that uh, uh, you hear about in the gospel. That's pretty cool. There's Jerusalem. And um, Bethlehem is about seven miles from Jerusalem. Bethany is a little bit closer. That's where Lazarus and Martha and Mary lived. And, um, well, there's just so many things there. But you can see where the Jordan River is. You know what the Jordan River is? It, it, um, it starts up there at Caesarea Philippi. There is a, a big uh, spring of water. I've seen video of it coming out of the ground. Uh, really a pretty tremendous amount of water from a natural spring that flows all the time. And it's been flowing for the last 2,000 years, for sure. And then you see the Lake Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. And of course, we hear a lot about that. Jesus spent a lot of his time up there around there. And that's where Peter lived. You see Capernaum up there. That's where Peter's house was. And, um, and so the water from that spring up at Caesarea Philippi, it flows down into the Sea of Galilee. And then the overflow uh, from the Sea of Galilee is the Jordan River. 
It's the overflow. And it flows all the way down to the Dead Sea, which is about mm, 75, 80 miles. And uh, the Dead Sea is very, very, I, I think it might be one of the lowest places on earth. And it has no outlet. So where does the water go? It evaporates. And uh, the Dead Sea has a really, really high salt content because it's been evaporating this water for thousands of years. And uh, it's very, very salty. In fact, it's so salty that nothing can live in it. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. There aren't any fish in it. And actually, there's a little spiritual lesson to learn from that. The Dead Sea has no fish in it. The Sea of Galilee is full of fish. Um, it's, it's just full of life. The water goes in and the water goes out of the Sea of Galilee. And so there's always fresh water. But nothing goes out of the Dead Sea. How about our lives? If we are always taking in the blessings and the grace of God, and then we give it out through others, loving God, loving our neighbor, serving our neighbor, then the grace of God is flowing through us all the time. And our lives are full of life. So don't be like the Dead Sea and just be a taker. Give me, give me, give me, and you're just a taker and you're not a giver. Receive from the Lord and then give to others. And then your life will be blessed and your life will be full. Okay. Well, that's a little bit about the Jordan River, where you can take the screen down now. Thank you so much, Paul. You're so good at that. Um, the um, John is a great prophet, and he quotes the prophet Isaiah. He says, I'm a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. And so John is called the precursor. He is speaking ahead of the Messiah. He's preparing the way. He's telling people, get ready. The Messiah is, is coming very soon. And he said, you don't want the Messiah comes and, and to come and to find you living in these terrible sins that you're committing. So he said to repent. What does the word repent mean? Literally, it means to turn around. You're going one direction and you turn around and you walk the other direction. It's a 180. It also means to change your mind. You've been thinking in one way, now it's time to think in a different way. To repent of our sins means to turn away from them, to think about them differently. Repentance is a decision. A person has to decide, I don't want to live that way anymore. Maybe you have a problem telling lies and you want to be honest. Well, you, you've got to make a decision. I, I, I'm not going to lie anymore. But then they'll come to the temptation to lie to, for whatever reason, and, and you'll have to resist it. Or maybe you have a problem with gossip. You talk about other people and you tell bad things about them. And you have to change your mind and say, no, I don't want to ruin people's reputation. I don't want to, to make other people look bad. 
And so you make a decision. I'm not going to say that kind of thing anymore. And you do your very best to, to do that. And of course, to, to carry out your repentance, you need God's grace. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what John the Baptist told people. He said, the one coming after me, he said, I baptize you with the water. But he said, but the one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And of course, that's what happened on Pentecost. The apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire appeared above their heads. And they were never the same. And that's what we all pray for in our own life. You pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the power of the Holy Spirit in you can turn you away from sin and help you to live a holy life. On your own, you can't do it, kids. On your own, you can't do it. You don't have the power. But all the power in the world is with God. And so all we have to do is open up our hearts, open up our wills, and say, Lord, let your will be done in me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can uh, live a holy life. He said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. You know what vipers are? Snakes. You bunch of snakes. <laughs> who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Hmm. What's he saying? He's saying you have to produce good fruit. Actions. Don't just say you, you want to be better. You have to actually be better. You actually have to stop committing those sins. Talk is cheap. And don't say, Abraham is our father. What does he mean by that? He was saying, oh, you'll say, well, I'm a Jewish person. I'm part of the Jewish people. And remember, they are the chosen people. They are God's special possession, dearer to him than anybody else. So Jews would say, well, I'm not one of those lousy pagan Gentiles. I'm a Jew. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of Abraham. John the Baptist said, don't give me that. God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones if he wanted to. What would some people say today if John were here? Some people would say, well, I'm a Catholic. I belong to the church that Jesus established, the church that has the fullness of truth and the fullness of the means of salvation. Of course, God loves me. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> and John would say, don't say I'm a Catholic. God can raise up Catholics from these stones if he wanted to. While you're eating, Jane, shut your TV off. Um, and um, do, you, do you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. There are some people who think just because they're a Catholic, they got it made in a shade. There are people who think because I'm a Catholic, I, I mean, I mean, I'm gonna when I die, I'm gonna go to heaven. I'm a Catholic. I've been baptized. That's it's all good. And they don't really have to live a holy life. Not true. There are people who in other churches who say, Well, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, I've been saved by the blood of Christ, you know, and and, and they don't think they have to actually have to follow Jesus. They don't think they have to live a good holy life. All those things are wonderful. But if you don't actually follow the Lord, 
if you turn away from him and turn to sin, you're not going to be saved. That's exactly what John preaches. Look what he says. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What's that fire? That's hell. He says, if you don't produce good fruit, you're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. And he's going to repeat that in just a, a little bit. And we'll, re, we'll go over that here in just a moment. It said the crowds asked him, what should we do, John? You say produce good fruit. What should we do? He said, whoever has two coats, give one to the man who has none. So he says, share. He said, if you have extra food, give to those who are hungry. Even tax collectors were coming forward to be baptized. And they said, what should we do? He said, don't collect more taxes than you're supposed to. Stop cheating the people to make yourself rich. And it says that soldiers came forth and said, what should we do? He said, uh, stop bullying people and charging people falsely and be content with your pay. I think it's interesting what John tells people. Does John tell tax collectors to stop being tax collectors? No. Does he tell soldiers to stop being soldiers? No. What, what does he tell people? He tells people to do your job in a good and honest and holy fashion. He doesn't tell them to stop doing their occupation, but just to do it in a good fashion. Well, if John the Baptist came today and he spoke to students, what would he say? And the students asked John, what should we do? And John said, Jane? Be good students. And how do you become a good student? Do your school work. Do your school work and don't, Agnes? Cheat. And don't cheat? Absolutely. He would say, do your school work. Don't be lazy. Don't cheat. Actually try to learn something. That's being a good student, right? And, uh, what about teachers? And the teachers came to John and said, what should we do? And John said to the teachers, Agnes? Um, teach what you've been told to teach. Okay. How else can a teacher be a good teacher? Jane? Be content with what you're paid. <laughs> yeah. Agnes? Don't like single out a student with too much um, mean or like don't be cruel to one student and don't make somebody a teacher's pet. You're absolutely right. Be fair. He would say, you know, do the best job teaching you can. Don't be lazy. Make good lesson plans. Don't pick out a kid and be cruel to him or pick out a kid and, and, and be super nice to that one. Don't play favorites. All the things that teachers sometimes do wrong. Yeah, that's what John would say to us. Well, since you're children 
And the children came to John and they said, what should we do? And John said, I'm going to go to Kate. She hasn't said anything yet. Obey your parents. There you go, Kate. Obey your parents. Honor them. That's what the commandment says, to honor your father and your mother. And maybe even be nice to them. Love them back. They love you all the time. How about giving them some love back? Kate, do you ever give your mom a hug and say, I love you? Good. That's a wonderful thing. Um, verse 15. Now, the, now, you should understand this, and you should be able to answer this question. Now, the people were filled with expectation. And all were asking in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. Why were they all filled with expectation? Agnes. Because of Daniel's prophecy. There you go. Uh, I think you learned. I think you guys are learning something. Yeah, Daniel had prophesied it was going to be um, uh, 490 years, and those years were running out. And so maybe this is it. Maybe he's the guy. John answered them all, saying, I am baptizing you with water, but one mightier than I is coming. I am not worthy to loosen the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John is very clear. I am not the Messiah. But he's coming very soon. And he continues in verse 17. His winnowing, he's talking about the Messiah. His winnowing fan is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Well, I don't know if you quite understand all those words. Uh, those are some uh, agricultural terms. What is winnowing? What is a winnowing fan? What is a threshing floor? You may have never heard those things. Agnes is going to give it a go. So I think the winnowing fan is what they like when they they like beat the wheat against the floor and separate the grain from the, I think you said chaffed, which is like the extras. You're actually, you're absolutely right. And the threshing floor would be today, we would use like a concrete floor, you know, but they would pack down uh, bare dirt. And, you know, you've seen a path that's really packed down and it's almost like concrete. And so they would have a very flat area, clear of any grass or anything, and it's packed down dirt. That's the threshing floor. Or maybe they even built it out of wood, and they would have outside a wooden floor. Maybe, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, primitive people do this. You're right, Agnes. They take the wheat, and they use sticks or whatever, and they hit the heads of the wheat and they knock out the tiny grains of wheat. But in there, there's all this chaff, all this little, as you called, extras. It's like the hull. You see it in the bottom of your popcorn bowl when you eat popcorn, you've got these little holes and stuff. And there's a gazillion of them. And you don't want that chaff in with your wheat. It's no good. You want pure wheat because you're going to grind that with a millstone and you're going to make flour out of it and you're going to use that to make your bread okay they would on a windy day they would take the wheat and the chaff which are all mixed up and they would throw it up into the air and the chaff is very light and it would blow further 
but the wheat is a little heavier and it would fall next to you on the threshing floor where you could sweep it up and you could pick it up. But the chaff would blow further away in the wind. So they used the wind, the power of the wind to separate the wheat from the chaff. What if you didn't have any windy days and you wanted to do this work? You would use a big fan. Like a, like a fan that you fan yourself with. And you would create your own wind. So you've got a pile of wheat like on a table. And you would use that and you take your hand and you, you move it around and you, and you blow the chaff away and then you have the wheat left. That would be a little bit slower because you can just do a handful at a time. That's what John the Baptist said. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He's coming. And what's he going to do? He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. The wheat goes into the barn and the chaff goes into the fire, right? And uh, yeah, what kind of fire? Jane. The fire of hell. It is the fire <laughs> of hell, but what does he say? He, what's the adjective? What kind of fire, Agnes? Unquenchable fire. Unquenchable. What does that mean? It means you can't put it out. It means it burns forever. There are some people who don't believe in hell as an eternal punishment. They're wrong. Hell is an eternal punishment. Every time John the Baptist talks about hell, he uses terms that mean eternity, unquenchable. You cannot put it out. Jesus will say the same thing later. He talks about the unquenchable fire. Jesus talks about where the fire never goes out and the worm never dies. And so when Jesus and John the Baptist, when they describe hell, they describe it in terms of eternity. That's really, really important. We have to get that firmly in our minds. Heaven and hell are real, and heaven and hell are eternal. You cannot lose your place in heaven. And you cannot escape your place in hell. And this, right from the beginning of the gospel, this is very clear. So many people today don't believe this. In surveys taken in America today, only about one third of people in America believe hell exists. About two thirds believe heaven exists, which is really stupid. The same person, Jesus, who taught us about heaven, taught us about hell. But you see, hell is such a terrible thought that people simply choose to say, I don't think it's real. And there are some people who actually believe in Jesus, and they say, well, Jesus is so loving and good, he would never punish somebody forever. People choose whether they go to heaven or hell. People choose to be with Jesus or to be against Jesus. It's not that God just flips a coin and says, oh, bad for you, Henry, you're going to hell. No. He creates us with a free will and we choose. We are going to choose to follow him, love him, follow him. Or we're going to choose not to love him and not follow him. And that's what decides our eternity. So it's really us making the decision. Now it says that Herod arrested John. 
It says Herod had been censured by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife. Remember, there's a bunch of different people named Herod. And um, the woman's name is Herodias. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, and she left one, she divorced one of the Herod brothers, and she married a different Herod brother. He was richer and more powerful, so she was what we would call a gold digger. She's just, you know, in it for herself. Of course, that's, you, that, that was against the Jewish law, and that's also against the Christian teaching about marriage. And John the Baptist, you know, he spoke about this because Herod was the ruler and John is calling people to repentance and he's publicly, publicly announcing that the king, King Herod, is living with a woman and that's not his wife, that's his brother's wife and, and this is a very bad situation. And she hated John the Baptist, and she talked her husband into arresting him and putting him into jail. And later, she will talk him into killing him. People in power, they don't like it when uh, people speak the truth about them. If you speak the truth in your lifetime, there are people in power who will punish you. Sometimes you bring up the truth about your local bishop who's living a horrible life. Some of the bishops today are terrible. They're living in mortal sin. They're they're stealing money. They're homosexuals. We got some really bad bishops. And if you point that out, boy, do they get mad and they will do everything they can to punish you in the church. Maybe there is a politician and you point out the fact that this senator or this governor or this president is living a horrible life, a terrible life. They support abortion. They support same-sex marriage, these evils. And yet they claim that they are uh, good Christians. When you point that out, or they get mad. You wish they would repent. You wish they would change their mind, that they would change their way. But instead of repentance, they just want to shut you up. And this has always been the case. And I imagine it always will be. But we should still speak the truth. Even if it cost us. And it certainly cost John the Baptist. It cost him his freedom. And then it cost him his life. But Jesus later will speak of John and he will say he was the greatest man ever born of a woman. And so Jesus praises John very highly. And the next paragraph, we have the baptism of Jesus. Jesus came to John, and it's not all in Luke's gospel. you got to read all the gospels. And John said, you should baptize me, not me, you. But Jesus said, let it be so for now. Why do you think Jesus? It says people would line up on the edge of the river, and John would take them one by one and baptize them. Why do you think Jesus would get in line? You know, and let me make a distinction. What kind of baptism was John doing? John was not giving Christian baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No. 
That had not been revealed to him yet. What was John's baptism? It was called a baptism of repentance. John was saying the Messiah is going to arrive any day. Don't let him catch you in your sins because he's going to separate the good from the bad, the wheat from the chaff. You had better get ready for the coming of the Messiah. And so his was a baptism of repentance. By going into the river, you were saying, I want to get ready for the Messiah. I want to turn away from my sinfulness and be pleasing to him when he comes. Why would Jesus get into a line like that? Did Jesus have anything to repent of? Did Jesus have any sins that he needed to stop committing? It's not a hard answer. Why do you think? Yes, Agnes. Ugh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I don't know what you said. I lost my train of thought. Why would Jesus do this? He had nothing to repent of. Yeah, Janie? As an example for other people? Perfect. That's exactly right. Jesus wanted people to listen to John. He wanted them to be baptized. John said, you should baptize me, not me, you. John basically said, you don't need this. But Jesus said, let it be so for now. He wanted to give a good example. He wanted everybody to believe John and to turn away from their sins. So he goes into the water. He dunks under the water. When he comes up out of the water, it says the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. We don't know exactly what that means. Later, John will say, I saw the Holy Spirit come down upon him like a dove. Well, was it something that everybody saw? Or did just Jesus or did just John the Baptist see? Was it a real bird? Did a real live dove come floating down and land on Jesus' head or his shoulder? I guess it could have been. Uh, we simply don't know. Or did John the Baptist have a vision of the Holy Spirit, like a light or something, and it just came down kind of slowly like 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 a bird would come down landing we really don't know but whatever it was it certainly convinced john that jesus was the messiah later john will say that god had spoken to him and said the one that you see the holy spirit come down upon that's the one he's the messiah and so John was certain that Jesus was the Messiah. And then a voice spoke from heaven. And the way it's written, it looks like everybody heard the voice. But again, we're not absolutely certain if everybody heard it or not. But it says a voice spoke from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. This is one of only a couple times in the gospel where we see all three persons of the Blessed Trinity at the same place and same time. The Father speaks from heaven. The Son, Jesus, is standing in the Jordan River. And the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. See, the Holy Trinity is one of our basic beliefs. 
And this is a good place where you can see all three persons of the Holy Trinity at the same place and time. Then Luke gives a genealogy of Jesus. Well, before that, he says, Jesus began his ministry when he was about 30 years of age. And so that's how we know it. Jesus is around 30 when he becomes a public person. Why did he wait so long? He's going to die and resurrect at about 33. We're not exactly sure why. One of the guesses that a lot of people have thought over the centuries is that he did not start his public ministry until after St. Joseph died. After St. Joseph died, that's when he began his public ministry. Before that, he was helping out St. Joseph. That makes sense to me. And of course, we never hear from St. Joseph in the gospel. He doesn't appear at all in Jesus' public ministry. Mary does. We see Mary at the wedding feast of Cana, and we see Mary at the foot of the cross, and we see Mary at Pentecost after the resurrection. But never once do we see Joseph. And so we're assuming that he had died. And I think there is a very, very big lesson in that. We have people who we love very much who get sick and we want God to cure them. And sometimes they die from their sickness or sometimes they die from an accident. And some people, I've seen it in my lifetime, some people get very angry at God. And they say, why didn't you save my child? Why didn't you save my spouse? Why didn't you save this person? You could have cured them. You could have kept that accident from happening. And they blame God. I hope you never do that. We must never blame God for anything. God is all good and all holy and all powerful. And yes, he could save your loved one from dying. But remember, Jesus let Joseph die. Don't you think Jesus loved Joseph? That was his foster father. He lived with him for the first 30 years of his life. Don't you think he loved him with a human love more than anybody on earth except his mom, his mom, and his dad? Most people love their mom and dad very much. And if they can, they would get the medicine, take them to the hospital, and uh, do everything they can to save their life. So Jesus, who was a real human, he loved his mom, he loved his dad, and he could have kept St. Joseph from dying, but he didn't. He allowed St. Joseph to die. I just think you always have to remember that. Part of being a human is that you're going to be born and you're going to die. It's going to happen one way or another, at one time or another. And God, in his wisdom, knows the best way and the best time we would never pick it my my dear wife ann got cancer and she died last summer 
We would have never chosen that. And we prayed that she would get well. But God, in his wisdom, took her. Only when I get to heaven will I have an understanding of why here on earth I have to trust. God calls us to trust. That's what it means to put your faith in Jesus, to trust him. To trust him with your life, to trust him with your mom and your dad's life, your spouse, your kids, that you trust God. And so I think it's helpful to remember that the person that he loves second most on this earth, Jesus let him die. So when, when sad things happen to you, and they will, do not blame God. Do not be angry at God. But be accepting of God's will. Well, um, then Luke gives us this long genealogy, which is a list of all of your ancestors. The people who came before you in your family tree, those are called your ancestors. The people after you in the family tree, what are they called? Starts with a D. Agnes? Descendants. Descendants, that's correct. And um, so that brings us to the end of chapter three. You guys, for next Tuesday, read chapter four. We'll go over that. Um, let's see, do we have any vocabulary today? Uh, tax collectors, they gathered taxes for the Romans. They usually cheated people. They gathered too much and made themselves rich. And most everybody hated them. All the Jewish people hated them. Um, I already went over repentance in the Jordan River. So, yep, that's our vocab for today. Um, our lessons, it's it's not who you are, but how you live. Yep. You can't just say, oh, I'm a Catholic. God going to take me to heaven. No, nope. you have to live out the faith. Nowhere can a man serve God better than in his daily work. Yep. John the Baptist, he didn't tell him to stop being tax collectors or to stop being soldiers. He just said, do it right. You can serve God every day in your everyday work. And for you guys, that's being students and being children. So be good students and be good children. And you know how to do it. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon us so that we can always choose what is right and live in a way pleasing to you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Sure, Grandpa. Okay, bye. God bless you.